I was a rebel against God. I was born in sin. I was in a prison cell. The gospel awakened me to the fact that I was lost and I couldn't get out. I was headed toward destruction fast. Because of my rebellion against God, the enemy had legal rights to harm and harass my life. I belonged to him, but I wanted out. The prison bars were too strong. I yelled for help, but I knew I was doomed because when the enemy would come in the end, he would finish me off. He was going to destroy me, and he was going to relish every minute of it. Then, in came my intercessor. He stood between me and my accuser, and he took the beating that was rightfully mine. He took the blow that was intended for me. He was beaten, he was tortured, he died. God died for me. The chains of sin that had been fastened around my arms fell to the ground. The sign over my prison cell had always said condemned, separated eternally from God, guilty. But suddenly it changed to justified, forgiven, redeemed. I was finally free. But there was a problem. The blood of Jesus Christ had been shed. He was killed. But I was still praising God from within the prison cell. I was thanking God for changing the sign on the outside of the prison cell, but what I should have been doing was getting up and walking out the door that was unlocked for me by the death of His Son. I just needed to test the door. I just needed to walk out of that dark prison cell and smell the sweet air of liberty and freedom in the life of Jesus Christ. When I stepped out of the prison cell, there was a vehicle waiting Emissaries from the king brought a message telling me that the king had beckoned me into his presence. I was stunned. I was a rebel. I was completely undeserving of the freedom I had received. The living God had given up his life for me and set me free. And now the king was beckoning me into his presence. In an effort of honesty, I said, are you sure you have the right guy here? I was a rebel. I spat in the king's face. How could he want me? Their only response response was, the king beckons you. We got in the vehicle. As we pulled into the kingdom, I began looking for where they might drop me off. I was expecting to go to the servants' quarters or the poor district. Where are you taking me, I asked. Their reply startled and frightened me. Into the very near presence of the king. He wants you to live right where he lives. I felt a wonderful mixture of excitement and fear. I'm a rebel. I don't deserve to be anywhere except the prison where he found me. I stepped out of the vehicle, and with trembling knees, I began the long walk up the steps that led to the front entrance of the royal palace. One of the emissaries that had delivered the first message came up behind me and said, there's something else you should know. The king wants to adopt you as his own son. Me? His child? I came into his presence totally broken by the reality of what he had done for me. I bowed my face to the ground and said, I don't deserve this. Why have you done this for me? His simple reply was, I love you. He raised me to my feet, and with a strong, loving voice, he said, I have a commission for you. Again, I was shocked. For me? You want me to work for you? Yes, I want you to work for me. I want you to represent me. I was still in shock from being brought into his presence, but being asked to represent him was beyond my comprehension. Absolutely. Anything I can do for you, just tell me. As he looked into my eyes, I could see that his thoughts were far off. I need you to go back to that prison cell that I rescued you from, because there are so many more that need to know about me and my love and my truth. They are still in chains of misery and hopelessness and despair. Will you go for me? I remembered the terrible stench of the prison. The memory of the chains that had bound me just hours before sent chills through my being. But after all the king had done for me, how could I say no? I said in a heartbeat, I will gladly go for you. I'll do anything you ask. His face was serious as he continued. I'm going to send you out, and you're going to be like a sheep among wolves. They will hate you. They will persecute you. They will do whatever they can to harm you. I made my decision. I'm all in. I'll do it, Lord. You shed your blood for me. 
I will gladly share my blood, shed my blood for you. Take me and spend me any way you want. I belong to you. Take me, use me, send me. Not only did he free me from sin, not only did he invite me into his presence, not only did he adopt me to be his child, but he commissioned me to bear his name. He wanted me to represent him. That is a privilege above all privileges to bear the very name, the very reputation of the invisible God, of God Almighty. And he said, I ask you to go. Go and make disciples of all men. Go and be unashamed of my gospel and preach it. Go and rescue the lost in the power of my name. I responded with a quiet determination. I'll go. As I was beginning to head out to do his work with his blessing, he said, wait, there's something else. Not just the penalty. Not just my presence. Not just adoption as my child. Not just the commission to represent me. There's more. What he told me next was so condescending on the part of our king. It's so bewildering. It's so extraordinary. It's so amazing. And this is the truth that turns the world upside down. I'm going with you. I want to fill you with my power. I want to keep you safe with my protection. I will live in you and through you. As you represent me, I will lead you and guide you. What I'm sending you to do is impossible. I know. If you do it in your own strength, you will fail. I don't care. I'm willing to do whatever you ask of me. And if you want me to go in there and just die, I'm willing. I'm sending you out to be a victor. My children will not lose. Would you give me your body? And I will come in and make my home. And I will take your hands and use them as my hands. I will take your feet and use them as my feet. I will take your mouth and it will speak my words. I will take your eyes and allow you to see the world as I see it. I will take your heart and cause it to beat with my burdens and you will care for the very things that I care about. And your life and your attitude and your behavior every minute of every day will be the very behavior of God. Will you allow me to overtake your life? When we're yielded to the Holy Spirit of God, when we are filled with His power, we can go into this world like little lambs with the faces of lions. Because the living God Almighty, the consuming Almighty Sovereign God dwells within His children, and we stand, and the wolf pack surrounds us, we stand in the authority and name of Jesus. And we will not back down because we do not head off to war to lose, we go to war to win. Our God mocks all the power of earth and hell through weak little lambs because His lambs beat the wolf packs. The gospel trounces upon the powers of earth and hell and demonstrates to the universe the wisdom and power of God that He is in control. Even though we look weak, and even though physically and naturally we are weak, spiritually, greater is He that is in us than He that is in the world. We need to rise up Proclaim the gospel and say, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Will you join me? God is looking for men and women who are completely given to him, that he can equip with the whole armor of God. God's looking for men and women that he can train to face the forces of evil in this world. The same invisible God that created the entire universe by just saying the words and created you in his very image wants you back. He wants you to accept the payment He made on the cross for your sins. He wants, you to, he wants to set you free from the prison cell that keeps you from reaching your potential. He wants you to live as His own child. He wants to send you as a champion into the battle against an invisible enemy, and He wants to go with you. Will you accept? I want you to take your Bibles and go to Matthew, if you would, this morning. Matthew chapter 10. Last, well, two weeks ago, we preached from this passage and Jesus sent out his disciples and he said to go out and preach the gospel and heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely receive, freely give. Last week, we skipped down to verse 16, Matthew chapter 10, verse 16, and Jesus told his disciples this. He said, behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Sheep in the midst of wolves. I want to continue that thought a little bit more this morning. 
what I read to you at the beginning it wasn't original with me, but I thought, hey, that fits so well. I just want to read that because that encourages my heart. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in the same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. Jesus sent out his disciples, and he said, I want you to go out to all the cities that I'm going to go to. And when you go, I want you to tell them the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And as you go, I want you to heal people. Cast out the, the demons and, and raise the dead. And, and um, you've received freely, so I want you to give freely. And I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. And when you go out, you are going to be brought into their councils. You're going to be brought into their synagogues. They will persecute you. They will hate you. They will beat you. And they will kill you. And they went out. And the Bible says they went out and they went to all these cities. In another place, we have them coming back and rejoicing of all the wonderful works that God did through them. I want to challenge you to be one of those this morning that follows God's command to go out, share the gospel, talk to people, be the example However it is that God calls you to serve Him, go and, and do that. But there's four words that I want to give you this morning that are going to help you as you do that. Look at these two verses. Look at verse number 19. Look at verse number 19. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak. For it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. Can you picture yourself in this situation? You've been maybe brought in to be uh, examined for what you believe. Maybe, maybe you've been brought into a court for some reason. Maybe like the Apostle Paul, you have, you have been arrested and now you have to defend yourself. What are you going to say? What, what are you going to say when you get there? And, and what he is saying, Jesus is telling his disciples is, listen, don't worry about it. Don't worry about what you say, but when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak. Don't worry about it. I'm going with you. I'm there before you. So just do what I told you to do. Just obey the commission that I'm sending you on and don't worry about defending yourself. Don't worry about the words that you're going to say if you find yourself in a situation where you have to defend yourself. But I'm going to give you four words because I believe this will help us as we go through this. The first one is faith. The word faith. When you look at verse 19, and you see this phrase, Take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. To be able to go into that situation, whether it's the, the council or the synagogue, or wherever it is, and not worry about what you're going to say. How many of us like speaking in public? I'm not going to raise my hand, all right? Okay. I've rarely met people that like speaking in public. But let me tell you what I do. Whenever I'm getting ready to speak in public, I'll, uh, and because I, God called me to preach, so I'm just going to do it anyway, even though I, I don't feel comfortable with it, and I, I don't feel real good at it, but I'll, I'll get up in front of people, and before I do that, I will prepare. And I spend a lot of time preparing and finding the right words to say and, and putting it on paper. Now, some preachers can get up, and, and they can preach not even use a note. 
They can just, um, and, and they're just really good at it, and they get up, and as Brother Reed would say, they get up and wax elephants, and, and they just, they, they, they're great speakers, and they don't even have to try. It says, well, I know they try, but I have to prepare. I, I write my, my words down, and I, I want to make sure. I mentioned last week, one of my nightmares, it's a recurring nightmare I have, is getting up in front of people to talk and not have anything to say. That's a scary thought. But you see what Jesus is saying here. Don't prepare an outline. Don't prepare what you're going to say. Just go do what I told you to do, and don't worry about what might happen. Faith. Take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. So I'm supposed to go into this situation and just trust that God's going to tell me what to say. It means I'm going in unprepared. Well, I'm not unprepared. I'll get to that here in just a minute. But I feel unprepared. If you ever get in front of somebody and try to talk and you don't prepare. I, I was in a debate class in high school. How many of you have taken a debate class? Was anybody good at a debate class? I was not. I was a terrible debater. And I, I didn't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I mean, I didn't want to make that person look bad. And my best friend, we were arguing this case. And my best friend was on the other side. And he was arguing, arguing, arguing. Uh, I was almost in tears. I was like, I don't want to make my best friend look bad. Um, so uh, I'm not good at that. I'm not good at just speaking without, without plan. Um, they, um, speaking on the fly, if you want to say it that way. Just, just getting up and saying, I want to prepare. But Jesus said, listen, whenever you get in that situation, just have faith. I'll provide. I'll give you the words that you need to say. Don't worry about it. Don't stress over it. Just trust me. Faith is this. You won't know that God will come through for you until you're in this situation where He needs to come through for you. You don't get a practice chance at it. And Jesus didn't say, here, write this outline for whenever you're standing in front of that council. That way you know what to say. He just said, no, I'm going to give it to you. I'll help you say what you need to say. And I'll, I'll, in a little bit later in this message, I'll show you how, how that works. But don't worry about it. Go in by faith, knowing that God, God's going to take care of that. This is a huge step of faith. Here's, here's the practical application. Jesus said, I want you to go out. I want you to preach the gospel. Actually, it wasn't even the gospel. It was this, the kingdom of heaven is ahead. Tell them I'm coming. Tell them I'm, I'm, I'm right behind you, and, and the Son of God has come, and this, things are changing. I'm coming. I'm going to die on the cross and pay for their sins. I want you to come up, and I want you to do what I told you to do, and don't worry about it. I'll provide for your needs. That's what the first part of that chapter was about. The walls of Jericho, think about this. They didn't even budge until God was ready. But when God was ready, they fell down flat. Can you imagine the faith that Joshua had to have? It was seven days in a row. The first day they walked around one time around the wall of Jericho. He got the whole army up. All the soldiers, the whole army, got the priests, everybody up. They walked around the whole city of Jericho. Nothing happened. They go back. The second day, they get up, walk around the whole city of Jericho. They do this for six days, walking around at one time. Nothing happens. If it was me, I'd be thinking, okay, we're, we're, we're halfway into this thing now. At least we ought to be seeing some progress, but nothing. There's not a, there's not a stone loose. There's, there's nothing changed. But on the seventh day, as they walked around seven times, and on the last time around, they blew the trumpets and shouted, the Bible says the walls of Jericho fell down flat. They just needed to obey God, and when God was ready, he knocked the walls down. The Red Sea didn't part until the children of Israel were backed up against it by Pharaoh's army. But when it did part, it opened wide enough for more than a million people to walk through. So the question's not if you're going to be in a place where you need faith, but when you're going to be in the place where you need faith. And what you need to understand is when you are there, you don't have to worry about it. You can trust God. So if this statement is true, and here's what he said, Jesus said this, but when they deliver you up, when they deliver you up, he was talking specifically to his disciples that were going out and, and preaching to all these cities. And he said, listen, when they deliver you up, he didn't say if, if they deliver you up. He said when they deliver you up, when you find yourself in a situation where you need God to work, not if you find yourself in a situation where you need God to work. Listen, as you live this life, it's not a matter of if I'm going to find myself in a hard situation. It's when. When are you going to find yourself in a situation where you need God to work and you've got to have faith? It's, it's going to happen. 
It may be not exactly like the disciples of Jesus experience, but you will find yourself in a place where God has to work. It will happen. It's probably already happened. You're probably going through that right now. And when you get there, here's what you got to understand. God will be there waiting for you. Jesus said, listen, don't take any thought what you're going to say. Don't worry about what you're going to say. If you get arrested for preaching in this city, don't worry about what you're going to say. Just go in there. I will give you the words to say. Just trust me. That's a scary thought. Just trust me. He told them, go out, don't take an extra stick, don't take extra money in your purse, don't take extra coats, don't take extra clothes, just go out. I'm going to provide for your needs. And they went out and God provided for their needs. When you get there, God is already there waiting for you. God sent that angel to shut the lion's mouth before Daniel got thrown into the lion's den. Aren't you glad his timing was right in that case? I mean, if he would have been just a few seconds off, Daniel would have been thrown in, eaten, and then the angel's mouth would have closed the lion's mouth and too late. In fact, this particular set of lions, whenever the bad guys were thrown in, the Bible says that the lions broke every bone in their body before they hit the ground. The timing had to be just right. God was there before Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. Whenever he got tossed into the lion's den, God was there. He got into trouble. God was there waiting for him. What a great thought. You're going to get into a place in this life where you could say when they deliver you up, when challenges happen, when hard times come. And when that happens, God is already there waiting for you. In this case, Jesus says, listen, when you find yourself and and, uh, you're drawn in before these people and you've got to give an explanation for what you're doing, don't worry about it. I will give you those words to say. God was in the fiery furnace before Shadrach, Meshach, And Abednego were thrown into the fiery furnace. Again, if the timing wasn't right, it wouldn't have worked very well. The the soldiers that took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the fiery furnace, the Bible says the furnace was so hot that the people that threw them in died from the heat. God had to be there first. And, and, And we won't turn there this morning, but they were thrown in, and the Bible says their hats and hosen and everything Right? I'm picturing Robin Hood being thrown into, probably the wrong picture here, but they're, they're, they're thrown into this fiery furnace, but nothing burns. In fact, when they get them out of the fiery furnace, they don't even smell like smoke. God protected them. King Nebuchadnezzar looked in, you may remember the story, he looks into the fiery furnace, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the fiery furnace, and King Nebuchadnezzar looks in and he says, didn't we throw three men in? Bound, right? They were tied up, they were bound. We threw three men in bound into the fiery furnace. That wasn't very thoughtful. I mean, okay, that's just a dumb thought. They would have probably died before they hit the ground anyway, but they were bound up, they'd land on their head or something. But they threw them in, the ropes burn off, and he said, but now I see four men unbound walking around, and the fourth is like the Son of God. What, what do we get from this? God was there before them. The trial came, the hardship came, but God was already there. When they deliver you up, faith, faith, God is there. Don't worry about what you're going to do when the difficult situation arises. Just serve God and have faith that he'll be there waiting for you. Take no thought how or what you shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what you shall speak. The first word is faith. The second word I want you to get from this is study. Study. Now, it's not directly from this passage, but you'll see where it comes from here in just a moment. Verse 19, Matthew chapter 10, verse 19. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what you shall speak, for it shall be given you in the same hour what ye shall speak. Look at verse 20. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. The Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. We call Him the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. I'm going to give you the word study. And here's why. Put the Word of God into your mind or your heart. You can say whichever one you want there. So the Spirit of God can bring it to remembrance when you need it. That's how the Holy Spirit works. And I want you to see that. So go to John chapter 14. So Jesus said, don't worry about, take no thought about what you're going to say. Don't worry about that. But they're still supposed to be listening to his words. 
And they're still supposed to be listening to the words of Christ. And, and we are supposed to be still putting the word of God into our hearts so that when we find ourselves in this situation, the Holy Spirit can bring those words of God to remembrance and use them in this difficult situation. John chapter 14, verse number 26. Jesus is describing how the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, or the Comforter, all three of those words are used, how the Holy Spirit is going to work. And here's what he says, John 14, 26. But the Comforter which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. Here's what he does. Listen to this. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Jesus said to the disciples, go out and, and preach and don't worry about what happens. And when you get pulled in front of people and you're supposed to say something, don't worry about what you're going to say. I'm going to give you what to say. If we find ourselves in that situation, we've never spent time in the Word of God, and we, we haven't let the Word of God come into our heart and into our mind, what's going to happen is we're going to find ourselves in that situation, and the Holy Spirit will want to bring to remembrance what we have learned and what we have heard from the Word of God, but there's nothing there to bring to our remembrance. So the first word is faith. The second word is, is study. Study to show thyself. Approved unto God, a workman that needed thought to be ashamed. The Apostle Paul, think about him. Actually, go to Acts chapter 9, if you would. I, I, I love the story of the Apostle Paul. He's, he's saved on the way to Damascus. He's going up there to persecute Christians, kill Christians for what they believe. On the way up there, you remember this story, a bright light shines down from heaven, and Jesus speaks to him. Now, the Apostle Paul believed he was serving God. He was a zealous, he was a religious man, he was serving God. He just didn't realize that Jesus is God. The light shines down from heaven. The Apostle Paul says, who art thou, Lord? And he says, I am Jesus. And the Apostle Paul realized it was Jesus that is God. Changes him completely. He gets saved, trusts Jesus as God. Okay, so You've got this story, the words of God now coming to the Apostle Paul. Acts chapter 9, I forgot to turn there, I was talking. Acts chapter 9, and look at verse number 3. Acts chapter 9, 3, you've got this, Dema this experience on, on the Damascus, <laughs> I can't say it right, Damascus road, not Emmaus road. All right, Acts chapter 9, look at verse 3. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? In my Bible, the words of, of Christ are in red. So in, in this is Jesus talking, so th this is in red. Anybody else that's in red in your Bible? Okay. Now, everything that the Bible says is the word of God, but some Bibles, are they, they're printed this way to show if it was Jesus that said it, it was in red. Okay. So in, in, my, in my Bible, it's in red. Every, every word of God is the word of God. We understand that, but this is Jesus talking. So he says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? In verse 5, and he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. If you skip on down to verse 11, the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street. Uh, yeah, arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul. Oh, I'm sorry, that's, that's, that's Jesus talking to somebody else. Okay, jumping ahead of myself, got excited. More red words, right? Here's what's happening. The, Saul is on his way to Damascus. He's going to persecute the Christians. The light shines down from heaven, and Jesus speaks to him. The words of God. Y you with me so far? He hears God speaking to him. Is Jesus speaking to him? Now, go to Acts chapter 22. Acts chapter 22, the apostle Paul has been mobbed by the, the Jews. He came back from his missions journey, he's, he's in the temple, and the Jews are, are, have been misinformed about him. They take him, they're, they're beating him, they, they want to kill him for, for preaching what they believe to be heresy. Acts chapter 22, verse 7, he's telling the story of what happened. This is what Jesus is talking about. Jesus said, listen, go out and preach to all these cities, and, and in this case, Paul's preaching the gospel now. He was preaching, he's mobbed by this crowd, he's brought into the, you can say council if you want to say it that way, there's a big group of people, he has to defend himself. And what does he use to defend himself? 
Look at verse 7. I fell to the ground, he's telling the story, and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest me? Whose, whose words were those? Those were God's words again. He didn't have to worry about what to say. Because God had already given him these words. He says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? He said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And in verse 10, he said, What? And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said unto me, Arise and go into Damascus, and there shall be told thee of all things which are appointed for thee to do. Here's my point. If we will spend time letting the word of God come into our heart, putting it into our heart, putting it into our mind, when we find ourselves in the situation where we have to defend ourselves or, or give an answer for the reason of the hope that is within us, as the Bible says, if you have the word of God in your heart, the Holy Spirit can bring the word of God up and use it. Bring it to your remembrance. But Paul wasn't done. Go now to Acts chapter 26. Just a few chapters later. From that point in Acts chapter 22, Paul has been under arrest. He's been in prison. He's been moved back and forth a couple times. Now he's finding himself standing in front of King Agrippa. As he stands in front of King Agrippa, Paul decides, I am going to try to give him my defense. I'm going to give him my story. I need to speak for, for where I am and, and tell him what's going on. So what's Paul do? Acts chapter 26, verse 14. He tells the story again, how he got saved. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now, if you have Jesus' words in red in your Bible, that's probably in red again. In mine it is. And, and really the whole point of this is for you to see this. The Apostle Paul, he heard the words of God. And whenever he found himself arrested or in trouble, those words of God came back out. He, he was able to say the words of God that he heard in verse, uh, 16, verse 15. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? He said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in which I will appear unto thee. And he goes on and he continues to, to tell him what God told him. This, this is why you don't have to worry. You can go and, and not worry, just say, I'm going to serve God, and I'm going to trust God's word, to, that, that Jesus will, will, will help me with the words to say the Spirit of God will do that, but you've got to put the words into your heart. Let me ask you this question. If you're arrested today, like the Apostle Paul was, how much of God's word would you have with you in prison? And think about this. If you were... You can say stranded on a deserted island, but I'm going to say arrested because that's, that's what we're using as the Apostle Paul. If you were arrested and they didn't let you take your Bible to prison with you, how much of the Bible would you have? If all you had was the clothes on your back, how much of the Bible would you have with you? How much have you put into your heart? How much have you read? How much have you studied? How much have you learned of God's character? Do you know what God likes and dislikes? Do you know the many promises that God's made to you? Have you memorized parts of Scripture that, can, that God can bring to your memory when you need it? I want to challenge you to do that. So the first word was faith. The second word is study. Spend time in the Word of God. Put the Word of God into your heart and into your mind so that when you find yourself in the place where you need it, the Holy Spirit can use it, and He can use it in your life. The next word is courage. And we're almost done, but courage. Jesus said to them, take no thought how or what ye shall speak. Don't worry about what you're going to say. Load your heart and mind with God's word, and he'll get the words out when the time comes. Acts chapter 4, verse 31, you've got an example of this. Acts 4, verse 31, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And what did they do? When they were filled with the Holy Ghost, it's talking about the disciples for the first church there, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. They spake the word of God with boldness. They spoke the word of God, but how did they do it? Boldly. This is in the same city where Jesus had just been crucified, and, and, and they were hiding in the upper room, but now they're speaking the word of God with boldness. Take no thought how or what you shall speak. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is doing what you're supposed to do even when you're terrified. We talked about Joshua. He must have been scared to fight against Jericho because God kept telling him to be strong and courageous. If you read Joshua chapter 1 over and over and over, be strong and courageous, be strong and courageous. 
I believe God's telling him that because he wasn't strong and courageous. I think he was scared. I would have been scared if I was in that situation. Courage is doing what you're supposed to do even when you're scared. You can face your critics with courage when you know that God will speak for you and through you. I don't have to worry about it. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to study the Word of God and put it in my heart. And whenever the time comes, I believe God's going to come through for me. And I can go courageously. You can share the gospel with courage. When you know that God wants people to get saved even more than you do. And he said he would go with you when you witness. What a thought. I can be courageous as I tell somebody about Jesus because he wants them saved more than I even want them saved. He died for them. The next word is peace. The next word is peace. Jesus said this to his disciples in Matthew chapter 10. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. Peace is knowing that God is in control. Peace isn't always everything going right. Peace is not, I mean, if I was arrested and I had to give an explanation for, for why I was a Christian, I wouldn't really think that's a very peaceful place to be. But whenever I know that God's in control, I can have peace. The word peace shows up 429 times in the Bible. And I'm not going to read all of them to you this morning. But here's a couple. Philippians 4, 7, And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. No matter how bad your storm is, you can go through it with the peace of God because Jesus is the Prince of Peace. What a thought. So Mark chapter 4, the disciples are on the Sea of Galilee. They're out there and they're, the storm comes up and the, the, the waves are so huge that they're afraid that it's going to turn their boat over. Mark 4, verse 37, And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was, talking about Jesus, he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. If you're ever in a storm on a lake, and the, the, the boat is going up and down and into the waves, and the waves are splashing in, you and me are probably not going to be sleeping. We're probably going to be losing our lunch over the edge of the ship. That, that's where I would be. You could join me there. Jesus is asleep. He's asleep in the back of the ship. Now, if you understand the way a ship works, the, the place where the least motion is right in the middle of the ship. But in the back of the ship, where it's going to go really up and really down and sideways, Jesus is in the back of the ship and he's asleep. Peace. Okay, so the storm is tearing the ship apart. He's sleeping on a pillow and they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. Peace is knowing that God is in control. So we're sent by our Savior into a dangerous world. This world hates God. We're, we're sheep in the midst of wolves, but you can go in faith because God promised to go with you. You can have courage because God's already there. You can have peace because God's in control. And you need to study the Bible so God can use it in your life. Father, I pray that you would use this to help us to be better Christians for you. You gave us this commission. You said to go out and preach the gospel to every nation and every creature. And Lord, I believe we can go out with courage. We can go out with faith. We can go out with peace. Lord, I pray that you would help us to spend time studying your word, getting in your word, so that we give your spirit the words in our hearts to bring to remembrance. Lord, I pray that you'd use us. Lord, I know that there's some folks here right now that they're in the storm. They're in the challenging time. They're in the hard time. And Lord, right now, this morning, I pray that you'd give them courage. I pray that they would find peace in you, knowing that you're in control. Lord, I pray that those this morning that are really struggling, somebody that's just really having a hard time, they can step forward in faith, knowing that you're right there. And you were there before the problem even started. Lord, I pray that you remind, remind everyone here this morning to turn to you during these hard times. Not to worry, to go forward, just keep serving you and trust that you'll get us through it. 